Hey everyone, welcome to episode 6 of Crushing On With Karen. Today on the podcast, we are joined by the magnificent, the extremely talented Nadia Dari's. For those of you who don't know, Nadia Dari's co-directed the new Star Wars Vision short called Our Song. She co-directed it with fellow South African um, Daniel Clark. I'm saying fellow South African like Sir Ramaphosa, but you all know what I mean. Um, so Nadia is a born and bred Cape Tonian and this beautiful short film which is based in the star wars universe so if those of you who've seen star wars vision season one it's basically a series of um short films that is set in the star wars universe um and just it tells different stories within the universe it's all animated and the first season they use only japanese animated studios and um animation studios and yeah and these different animation styles and things this season they open it up around the world so you can see um animated shorts from all over the world and the um, the south african one is called our song which is co-directed by nadia and was done by triggerfish animation you can hear more about the process of of how it came about and how her pitch was chosen in our interview. I just want to give you a little bit of a description of the story itself. So our song is about an alien child who longs to sing and is raised by her loving but stern father to stay quiet because of the calamitous effect her voice has on the crystals in the nearby mines. Um, this, This feels very like um short and vague but i'm telling you i I talk a lot about it in the actual interview but i just want to say how beautiful this is the animation style the story even the voices just everything is just soft and sweet and heartwarming and it's such a beautiful so it's the final episode of season two and it's such a beautiful ending of the season so if you haven't watched season two yet i suggest you do it and even if you just have time for one short go to the final episode and watch our song because you will not be um sorry there's also a lot of like south african aspects to it she speaks about it in the interview but like just looking out for it um I would suggest watching it before listening to this episode, but you know, you know, it's a short, it's not necessarily spoilers, but my suggestion is to watch it. But if not, listen to the the interview, it might encourage you to watch it more. Uh, I also just wanted to say that it's, it's Nadia is, we discovered to the interview, Nadia and I met for the first time when, when we did the interview and um but i had known about her for quite a while because obviously y'all know me i keep track with the news i know which south africans are doing amazing things i try to keep track of everything but that's not actually how it started with us um funnily enough so my mom is actually an avid line dancer so if for twice a week she goes and she does line dancing with a group of other older women and men and she came home one day from line dancing and she's like, oh, I was speaking to this woman at line dancing. I'd mentioned that my daughter is studying film. And she's like, oh, my daughter also does film. And then she had mentioned that her daughter's name is Nadia Darius. So, you know, being a journalist like I am, I Googled her and I saw that she was working on the Star Wars film. I saw that she had worked with Triggerfish. And, and you know, I was just keeping track of her life. So this, this interview is thanks in part to my mom who put me on nadia before the world was on her and um and yeah we you can see we 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 come from the same area so we bonded on a on another in another way and she was just such a lovely interesting person to have on the podcast so here's our interview with nadia darius so hi nadia welcome to crushing on how are you doing Thank you for having me. I'm good. <laughs> Just uh, got home from work and um, looking forward to chatting with you. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. So, um, so okay, let's go back to the beginning and um, tell us how your journey with animation began. Okay. <laughs> well, when I was a, when I, I never really knew what I wanted to study at school. But when I was in primary school, like grade three or something, I knew, I think I wanted to become an inventor or, uh, or, an, or an animator, right? I wanted to make like animation mm-hmm. films. I didn't actually know what an animator was. Um, but then um, fortunately I did very, I could, I could do well at school. So in high school, you know, I did really well. And I, I knew I wanted to do well because I, I knew that I needed bursaries to study, you know, to, to get freedom <laughs> after school. So um, I went to UCT for a year um, and I applied for, um, uh, what's it called, PPE. Um, mm-hmm. And I got accepted for that. But when I got there, I just did like random courses because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I found out that you could study animation. And so I decided to to transfer to the animation school in Woodstock and I got a bursary. And yeah, so um, basically I got into animation because, you know, in, in the world of animation, you can like, you can create anything, you know. Um, mm-hmm. If I had to study, if I had to continue to study the sciences, um, I think, you know, you learn a lot about the, the world, right? The earth and, mm-hmm. and the universe and you learn all the rules. But with animation, you know, you can... You can Google those rules and then apply those rules and then you can break them and you can create your own rules. You know, it's like a, a big playpen, really. So that's how I got in, into animation. And it's really thanks to the NFEF, the National Film and Video Foundation, that mm-hmm. basically um, sponsored all my studies. And I think they sponsor a lot of people's studies who want to get into animation, you know, because it's very expensive to get into it because, you know, you need a fancy computer and the fees is <laughs> it's very expensive. <laughs> So yeah, if, you, if uh, there's anyone out there that wants to get into it, I recommend looking up the um, NFEF bursaries. Mm. So, I mean, like the big news now is that you co-wrote, co-directed this amazing short film for Star Wars Vision. I'm was, I saying was like, our song. Our, our song. song. Yeah. Our mm. song. So how did you come up with the idea of our song? Um, so... Uh, so the first, the, the way that the whole thing happened is that um, Lucasfilm approached Triggerfish. Triggerfish is like the biggest animation studio in Africa. They're in Bergfleet in Cape Town. And then Triggerfish um, contacted people that they worked with in the past, myself included, Daniel included. And they asked people to like pitch stories. Um, we actually, I wasn't going to pitch any stories and he wasn't going to either. And then someone convinced us, basically begged us to pitch. And then I pitched a story about, you know, a, a character that sings to con- and connects to the force through singing. It was a different story to, you know, the story of the film now, but that's, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the core of the story. And then that got, um, S- Triggerfish selected my pitches as well as four other pitches. And then I met Daniel. Um, the two of us connected and we, we had chemistry and then we redid the pitch holding on to the part of like connecting to the force um, through singing, through the voice. Um, and then we pitched that to Lucasfilm and then they selected the film. So how I came up, you know, or sort of where that comes from, connecting to the force through singing, I myself, I sing and I, you know, I've always made music um, and since, um, since school and I've always, you know, felt a strong connection with singing. And so, you know, it's, it's very much inspired by personal experiences and just the magic that I experience when I sing, you know. Um, it's a very intimate experience. I learn a lot about myself and um, and I think it's sort of very underrated. So what better way to like express the magic of, of, of that I feel when I sing mm-hmm. than to connect to the force in the Star Wars universe through singing and through the voice, you know? It's also so like, like I mean, we obviously know that, 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 that the force, you, you, you know, you connect to it with feeling and with all this, but singing is such an such an obvious thing that I'm like no one has thought of before and it works so brilliantly in the story how <laughs> the singing just like like for me once she started singing and and things like I made sense I was like I need no other explanation like singing makes sense with the force it just works perfectly uh, that's great that you think that <laughs> that's, awesome. that's good news <laughs> uh. But what is it like to like sort of play in the Star Wars universe? Because I mean, I know it's like a vast thing that you could do so many things in. But like, yeah, how? What was that like? Man, it's it's really cool. You know, it's like <laughs> the you know George Lucas and the team and all of those people. Like they've 
they've created things that work. You know, they created this universe and they created multiple stories within the universe. So there's a lot of problem solving that they already went through, you know. So like coming in there, coming into an already existing like full universe with lots of stories and all of that, it just feels like... um, it feels like you're in a safe space, you know, because they've got this soundscape, which is amazing. You know, they've got their creatures. They've got their creature sounds. Lucasfilm themselves. They have their team on their side that are, you know, amazing with just creating like Foley, you know, or um, it's just like it, it just feels like such a safe space. It's like you're not coming into something and have, you're not having to figure everything out, like you having to solve every problem because a lot of the problems have already been solved. Um, I think that's that's probably... That was probably the, the the most notable thing about like working in the Star Wars universe and getting to create in that space, just like feel felt safe. And like, it, how did you choose, or how did you decide on the animation style that you used? Hmm. Well, so Tigerfish, the the Tigerfish Studio, they've actually they've done many films where it's like it's CG. But it looks like it's stop motion, and I don't know if I need to. Do I need to um, define what that is? I don't know if your listeners are know much about. I actually animation. don't know. Actually, maybe yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> explain stop motion. <laughs> mm. So stop motion animation is like uh, like Wallace and Gromit, and maybe Takalani Sesame sort of sometimes. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> when you have you have real puppets or real like you know, real things in real life that like animators mm. will come and actually move with their hands and they'll take a photo and then move and then take a photo. You know, it's like it's real stuff in the real world made with the real materials, plastic and material, mm. I mean, fabric and all of that stuff. So that's stop stop frame animation or stop motion. So it's like what, now, our, what our parents call like pop and cheese. So, like, <laughs> well, I think our parents call everything <laughs> pop and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry, go on. <laughs> But so Triggerfish actually, that's as a studio, I think they're like 20, over 20 years old, but they started out with making that kind of animation, you know, they'd like make little clay, little clay managies and then, you know, move them and then like, mm. take, you know, take videos of that. And that's how they made animation in the past. But now they, what they do is they create animation, CG animation or computer graphics. It's, it's all in the computer, you know, everything's done in the computer. So like our film, it's everything is done inside the computer, but it looks almost like it's real. It looks like it's mm-hmm. a real doll in real life, you know. So we, the reason why we, we went for that style is because we wanted the film to feel almost like, um, you know, when people watch it, or when kids watch it, whoever, it's almost like it's almost like you're watching toys, you know. It gives you that feeling or that memory of mm. when you played with your toys outside. And so we wanted because the design of the characters and the world, it's sort of like fantasy. It's like a, it's a little bit out there, you know. We wanted to ground it by making the, char- the 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 material of the characters feel real, like you could touch it, you know, like the ground and mm. everything almost feels like you could go in and touch it, like it's something real. So that's why we went with that style. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I saw, like, I think I saw in one of your pictures or in one of your presentations of, you know, th- those African dolls, like how that sort of influenced the, the dolls. how our, mm. e- yes, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, it just, it felt so much more real, like just seeing, you know, your inspiration no, and what you That's did. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, <laughs> not, to, not, not to make this about me, but like what resonated about with me is like no please with make the it story you, please. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> is that you know when I was watching it and I'm like you know our father is so protective over her and like doesn't want her to sing or use her voice because he's like he's more like he's scared of because this is what he knows and it just reminds mm-hmm. me um like it resonated with me because I'm like you know so many times our parents they they want to keep us like they don't want us to use our voices because they think it'll get us into trouble or Mm. to do things that will will sort of like you know yeah mess like mess with the with how things are supposed to be so for me I don't know what my question is but for me I was just saying like that's what like I mean, obviously, I'm not a child, but like as an adult, like watching this, I'm like, you know, this is what I felt like immediately upon watching the film. Mm, yeah, that's like interesting. Did. And, you know, I mean, look, I think that feeling, it's a universal feeling, you know, but mm. I think, you know, the fact that you're mentioning it specifically, I mean, I think our parents, there's a certain like, um, there's a certain, and I mean, I can only talk about this with you because we both South Africans and maybe we come from like a similar-ish culture. But mm. like, I, you know, I think our parents is very much like 
believed in saying yes boss you know like you don't mm. you don't speak out against authority you don't break the rules you just sort of you don't you don't want to stick out too much you want to be safe because being safe is like it's like the it's like that's the goal point that's like the goal you know so the parents just want the kids to be safe it's not about like oh you have a dream you must go for your dream even for me like even if my mother would say yes if you have a dream you must go for it but but mm. as soon as it comes to like any kind of details like no 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 you mustn't do that you mustn't do that you mustn't go there that's not yeah. for us that's you know that's for them that's rather stay safe so like i totally relate what, to what you're saying you know and i think for our parents or at least for my parents it definitely comes from that kind of place mm. yeah i think you know you know growing up i mean in apartheid and stuff like that and you know having to be scared all the time you know it, i think mm. it's fairly normal for them to kind of bring that out in the child so like yeah. you know seeing seeing how like you can imagine like for me i was like i imagine what her father must have lived through and have yeah. seen to to make him so protective over her. yeah um exactly and, yeah. and i think that's great like you know the star wars universe is so big but to create such a small intimate story within the universe is I think is a credit to the work you guys have done. Like, oh, kudos you so to you guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I mean, that was important to us, you know. It's just like, look, for us, when it comes to writing the story and how we did it and whatever, it might sound a bit airy flary, but like, really, the way it feel or felt to us is like, we both saw Ao in our mind, the cat, you know, the, the little girl, and it's like, it's her story. And it was our jobs. As, the, as writers, directors, it was our job just to, to just see her cl- more, and more and more clearly, you know, like what does she want to show the world? What does she want to say? You know, what does she want to she reveal to us? It's, you know, that's, that's how it felt for us making the film, you know. And mm-hmm. so I think that's how we were able to just center the story around her and her little story and her world and not like get caught up in all the Star Wars things, you know, because <laughs> we had a free reign, you know, like Lucasfilm was very... Um, they were very encouraging and they really wanted us to just tell the story that we wanted to tell, you know? So like, if you can imagine if like someone's telling you, here's this awesome universe and you can just like tell a story in the universe, like, you know, and we want you to tell Mm. the story you want to tell. It's like, you know, you (laughs) you can do so much. But for us, I think we both saw our early on. And so it was easy. It was sort of easier for us to just like tell her story, you know? So, you know, what do you want the audience to take away when watching the film? Um, so Daniel and I actually have different answers for this. But for me, I I really just, I want her, like, courage that she has, mm. that she, you know, that she has, that she carries in the film. I want her courage to, like, just infect people a little bit. <laughs> you know, like, if you watch people who watch the film, maybe afterwards you don't have to understand it or whatever. But you just feel like there's a slightly more, like, there's a slight slightly more openness in your heart you know just mm-hmm. a little bit of openness and whether that's hope or courage or just like it's almost like an appreciation for for vulnerability you know because like singing and also she's a little girl right and then she's also mm-hmm. singing like it's like it's something that that's vulnerable you know it's it's like when you sing out loud in front of people most people will feel self-conscious or feel like you know oh I'm, I mustn't sing I mustn't you know sing a tune I mustn't be loud I mustn't be you know heard in that kind of special way and I think I I hope that her bravery and her courage to just do that leaves people feeling a little bit more, I don't know, just a little something. <laughs> I think for, for, for Daniel, he, he, he really hopes that, you know, with the film, it's this, this young voice that sort of heals the land and, and, and a young voice that comes in and makes a big change. And mm-hmm. I think he really wants that aspect of the film to, to hopefully in, inspire young people, you know, to use, use their voices and speak out so you know tell me why do you think that um animation is an important tool for like african storytellers because in animation anything is possible (laughs) you know i think um i mean i obviously can't speak for i can't speak for africa and i can't speak for Mm -hmm. all africans and you know there's endless amounts of cultures and 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 um belief systems and languages and but I think there's something that, and I, I mean, I don't know if I'm wrong about it, but something that I pick up on is that we've got a lot of, um, we've got a strong connection to spirit, you mm-hmm. know, and there's a lot of like mystical, um, 
appreciation for that which is mystical, that which is beyond what you can see, you know, that which is more poetic and not so literal. It's like, you know, I think I think the value that we that we share, which isn't very Western, is that we don't need everything doesn't have to make perfect sense. Mm. Like, you know, um, you can you can like. Like we, you know, we have stories of, of like this, of like of, of certain insects or certain birds or like certain mountain, mountain parts of the mountain that has like old stories. And, and we, there's an appreciation for that. You know, we don't like, I don't think in general, we don't like really shun that stuff and say, ah, oh, no, that's, that's wrong or that's stupid. There's still like a persistent um, a value for holding on to things that seem bigger than us or seem magical. And for that reason, I think animation is a great medium because with animation you can tell, you know, you can create all sorts of fantastic fantasy-like or, or non-logical um, material, you know. It's just perfect for, like, storytelling that's based more on feelings and, and beliefs in things that that um, isn't necessarily, like, accepted in the West or sci- scientifically accepted. It's just, like, you could really just, like, express your heart and, 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 and it... The only limitation you have is like what you can imagine, you know, and then obviously budget, budget, because animation is very expensive. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I think it's it's a great medium for us. I was I was um, I was at some pitch pitch thing of like different animation. I think it was at Fame Week last year, last year, Fame Africa, or whatever. Mm. And um, mm. and I was like, oh, there's there's so much animation like talent in South Africa that I didn't like. I did. I never expected because obviously when we, I mean, we've seen the work that that you guys have done in Triggerfish, and there's just I just I didn't realize it was how much bigger than that it has been and and can be, and I think that we're mm. sitting at a point now where it's about to blow, like it's about to everyone's I hope about so. to see. Crossing fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you know, like when I studied animation, um, I think it was nine years ago, ten years ago, like it was. There were ma- like less than five like people of color in the class, mm. I think. But the round about, you know, it was very a very low number, you know. But now, if I go back to the school, it's like it's so diverse, and and also in in Jan- there's a school in Johannesburg as well that like the diversity in animation has increased so much, and there's so many young people now um, that that you know of of all sorts. It's it's not just uh, you know mm. it's. You know, different cultures, different cultural backgrounds that's yeah. creating in the animation space. So it's very exciting. I really hope that um, these artists can get financial support, and and you know, um, I hope so. Because Tigerfish just finished these like um, these ten films. It's called um, Kizazi Moto, mm. where it's like it's for Disney Plus, and it's ten films all created by um, African you know directors and storytellers and whatever, and. I think, you know, I think the films, you know, it's it's Disney's film, so Disney obviously has a big say um, in, in, in how the films, um, you know, how the stories go and all of that stuff. But I think it's definitely the first of of its kind in that, you know, like for Disney Plus at that scale, like 10 mm. African films told by African storytellers made by African, um, you know, artists. Like, I think that's a big deal. That's a first, you know, and that's coming out this year. And then that also coupled with um, our film, you know, as well, which is like mm. first um, African contribution um, to the Star Wars universe. So I really hope that's, you know, it, it means something. You never know, <laughs> you know. I hope the money comes pouring in from somewhere. <laughs> yes, no, no, I hope so too. So, you know, on that sort of how is your experience as being like a woman of color in the animation space how has it been unique or how has it helped you or you know mm. yeah well i mean definitely it's helped me it's the simple fact that i could get bursaries mm. i mean i'm assuming i don't know actually i think i remember there were um it, it wasn't just people of color that got bursaries but I'm sure that it played a role in me. I assume so, getting bursaries. Anyways, so, uh, you know, I think... <laughs> um, it, um, but, but at the same... I mean, I say that, but, like, it's just necessary, you know. There's not, mm. I wouldn't have been able to study if I didn't get bursaries. And I'm, I'm the youngest of seven kids and my sister above me. So she got a bursary and she went to go study. And then, you know, for me, that kind of set the example for me. And then and I sort of followed in her footsteps. So um, I think 
so when I got to college, like I said, it was, uh, you know, I was 19, I guess, when I started studying animation. And that was the first time that I mixed, that really mixed with other, you know, like white white kids. And, and, and there, were, there were very few black kids, but I had, you know, I had black kids in primary school and, and, and stuff. So it's just like really mixing. I mean, I, I don't like, I don't want to go to like, I don't like saying white and black. Um, mm-hmm. I hate that because it's like prescribing to an old system, you know what I mean? It's not forward thinking to me, but like, it was my first time mixing mm. with, with, you know, these, these kids or from other backgrounds. And when I started working, um, that was my biggest challenge when I started working was the mixing factor. And now like, um, I just, it, it's just like, I, I was like, um, encountering new worlds, you mm. know, it's like yeah, no, it different you. kinds of mindsets, mm. like having conversations, like how conversations would go. And if it touches on sensitive, sensitive topics, like the way that it would be spoken about was very different to what I was used to, you know, and then like going to feeling very self-conscious about my colored accent. Mm. Um, you know, like when I'm speaking, when I'm speaking now, you know, I'm sure you, you can relate when you're speaking to your family, yes. it's very different <laughs> to when you're speaking, yes. you know, in very a workplace. Sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. So just like confidence around um you know that in not being able to speak like proper english or as well as everyone else mm. or if, you know because you grow up with mingles and ugh, all that confidence stuff i think working on this film and then also obviously being a woman um they wouldn't you know uh, there's i know of one other theme local south african female director that's recently also last year directed um a film but like you know, you don't have like these people that you can look to and speak to yeah. for advice, like these women. Because, you know, anime, directing this film, um, I always thought I was a tomboy, but in directing this film and with Daniel, like I, I learned, wow, I'm a woman. <laughs> like the way I think about things or the way I would reach, you know, um, uh, conclusions is so different to how he would reach conclusions. It's so different to like how other like senior male artists um, in the production would reach conclusions. And I realized that while the system has really been built in a very masculine way, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, so I I don't know, like I'm so keen right now to speak to other, other women in the industry who have gone through this process to speak to them about that. Like, you know, uh, is they have they felt like a sort of there's a more f- feminine workflow and a masculine workflow and like how they've dealt with it and um yeah it's very interesting <laughs> no it is <laughs> i'm like listening to you and i'm like yeah you could like give a lecture and i would listen i'm like <laughs> i'm <feeling it>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man, sure so so but it's, w- that's uh, oh no go on no go on <laughs> no i was just gonna say um i think i wish I don't know. I feel like the kids, the kids were studying now. Maybe it's different, and if it's different, that's great. But like, just like if people to speak to them and like speak about the fact that you know, if you you know your accent and, and don't feel you know bad about your accent mm-hmm. or like just sort of speak about those sorts of things. You know, there's like a lot of like subtle things that I think. Um, uh, so-called uh, previously disadvantaged people uh, well, not so-called it's true I just find it difficult <laughs> sometimes to talk about these things um, especially now I'm talking from someone who comes from where I come from so now I'm actually I can f- maybe I should be more comfortable saying these things you know I, I don't have to be too political yeah. or whatever about it but like um, you know these things that we experience when you when you go out and into the working world and depending who you're mixing with and what cultures you're mixing with it's it can be so foreign mm. you know <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, you just gotta learn it. Like you gotta, you learn so much. But anyways, <laughs> no, but no, I, I agree. Like mine is a lot of a lot on the job learning how to mm. how to to navigate mm. through those different and and learning what you're okay with and what you're not okay with is is a whole different ball game. And you know what you mm. will negotiate with and what you won't. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose I do. I do wish that you know we should be talking to younger people about what they're going to experience because there's a lot. You know, there's the people like oh, you know, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, and you know, this is okay in the workplace and this is toxic. But there's a lot of nuances. Like if you are a colored woman, some things are more, some things affect you more than it would 
affect somebody else or another a woman who comes from a white background or a man or a colored man even like there's there's mm. there's, there's intricacies that we don't discuss and which but we probably should um mm. yeah and like talking about them would talk talking about them would probably it's uh, just like unnecessary sort of things that happen or or or, or, or like I mean, you know, sort of like things that end up in flames because, you know, you're holding something in for so mm. long or you're holding on to a certain frustration for so long simply because nobody talks about it. Mm. I think just having spaces where we can just talk about this stuff, like I'll see emotions, you know, sort of s- uh, spill out so that it doesn't like all like infect your career, you know, it doesn't like yeah. result in something like some sort of unfortunate thing that happens that didn't need to happen if you just like had people to speak about it with mm. people who understand. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh, like, sorry, like going on, like, like, I think a lot of problems in creative industries is that people like women tend to leave the industry instead of, you know, because because they've had such a bad experience at a particular job with a particular boss. And then we we sort of we lose that 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 knowledge bank because of because of that, because we don't talk about it because we don't. You know, we, we don't deal with the issues mm. because we're like, oh, no, they get replaced and it carries on and it carries on. You know, it's mm. a culture that we don't deal with, I think. Mm. Yeah. That's an, I mean, I've, I'm fortunate enough to not have encountered that, you know, mm. or like in the animation industry, but or I don't know if I have or not. But yeah, that's, I guess this thing is just, it takes time. Mm. Unfortunately, it takes, <laughs> it takes time and it takes a lot of, people to it takes you know individuals to be extremely courageous and like put their careers into risk and mm. speak out um it goes back to our song <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean courageous. i i i mean i i mean i don't know if it's not very smart for me to say this but like who knows you know maybe being like a person of color played a role in me my pitch getting selected, you know, being a woman, um, person of color, because, you know, like maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that's what like the, the sort of boxes that need to be ticked, you know what I mean? Like, um, right now, but, uh, so these are, you know, I think there might be a chance that that's played a role in certain opportunities, um, that I get. Um, and, you know, for me personally, it's, it's conflicting, you know, it's mm. like, it feels strange. I used to, I used to really, um, I, f- I used to hate it to, st- to a certain extent. And, and I've turned down opportunities because I've been told that, we, you know, we need more people of color, we need women or whatever. Mm. And then I turned those opportunities down because it felt to me like, okay, so, you know, do I actually matter or is it just the fact that I help your stats? Mm. You know, that type of thing. But now I feel like, I don't feel that way anymore. I feel like um, I need to accept myself, accept my story, and mm. accept that, you know, with people giving us opportunities or the government giving us opportunities in whatever way is, is just them trying to somehow do something, you mm-hmm. know. And, and it's, it's a hand that's reaching out. And I think right now I feel, I feel um, more accepting of a hand that's reaching out. Mm. Um, I think whereas before I felt it's confusing it's like you you know it's just like why do I deserve this why does this you know I don't know that's another thing I think it's that that should be spoken about more often Mm. but it's still your I also think that you know your unique perspective also probably made the story more (laughs) I mean, not, not, not to, not to, yeah, (laughs) not to go against your (laughs) co's, um, your team. But I mean, like, I think that because you come from that unique perspective, it tells the story like, um, yeah, yeah. um, like I have, like I have a habit after I watch something, I look it up, whatever on, on letterbox and I was looking up our song on letterbox and so many people were talking about like how, it just made them feel like it was like the feeling that they felt when they watched it and how, you know, how it was their favorite out of the series and stuff like that. And I was like, this is universal. This is, you know, in different languages. This is a people like this, this it meant something to people because of, and it could, and I'm very well could be your perspective coming in, 
you know, no matter how you got the opportunity, no matter how you were chosen, you know, what your perspective helped um, people across the world access emotions, access thoughts, and, you know, feel some sort of way. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> you know? Like, honestly, that's just like the biggest privilege, you know, I'm so, mm. so, 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 so grateful for that. And that. That is, um, and the thing that you're talking about, like, that is probably the biggest, the single biggest thing that can help with insecurity. It's like, mm. okay, like we're getting this opportunity to, you know, you know, both Daniel and myself, this is our first experience directing at this scale, you know, mm. you know, I mean, I've directed like a student short film or I've directed like smaller videos for businesses and stuff, you know, but like directing a film at this scale is something else, you know. So for, for both of us, I'm sure both of us had a bit of imposter syndrome, you know. But like when you get an opportunity that has a huge responsibility, it becomes bigger than your insecurities, you know. It's not about you anymore. It's about like, it's just about like people are saying, look, we feel like you could you could handle this responsibility. Can you please take it? <laughs> you know? And then it's just like, you know, I think that that for me, it that helps me so much just like get past my insecurities. Mm. Because then it's not so much about me. It's like, look, here's a responsibility. This is something that could potentially touch a lot of hearts, you know. Even if it's like if this touches three hearts, holy you know, holy crap, this is a big responsibility, you know. It's mm. like it 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 like my I, I can do this and die the next day and knowing that, okay, I did a good thing, <laughs> you know, just make three people smile, you know, or something like that. Like, so then if that type of thing definitely helps, um, helps one overcome the insecurities. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to ask you this, this must, this might sound like completely out of left field, but this is the question we ask everybody. So it's, but who was your first celebrity crush? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Oh, of course, Goku from Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> I love that you. Are I mean, on does brand. that count as a celebrity? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely Goku. <laughs> I love that. But what do you have coming up? Like, what are you working on now? Um, so I'm a co-founder of a small, um, small animation studio called Goon Valley. We do videos for like um, businesses, you know, but B2B and B2C and adverts and stuff. So I'm back back with the team again um, after finishing the film. I'm there right now. But otherwise, I'm writing stories. You know, I think if you're a storyteller, you can't stop, you know. Mm -hmm. Always yeah. writing stories, always making music. So... Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us, Nadia. It was amazing meeting you. Thank you so much for having me and letting me blabber along. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for watching the film and like letting me know how you feel, felt about it. You know, it's really thank you so much. Yeah, it's so it's on important. Disney Plus now for the listeners. Everybody, go watch Star Wars Visions. That was our chat with Nadia Darius. You can watch our song on Disney Plus. So yeah, you look for Star Wars Visions. I mean, I'm sure if you search our song, you'll find it. But the way I did it was I searched Star Wars Visions and then I went to the last episode of season two. Yeah, so thank you all for listening to our chat. That's all from us this week. If you would like to support the podcast, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash crushing on podcast. To catch us on social media, you can find me at, at Karen Walby on Instagram and at Karen Walby's with an S on Twitter. The podcast can be found at, at Crushing on Pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes on our website at crushingonpodcast.com and send any feedback to mail at crushingonpodcast.com. The show is produced by me, Karen. Rebecca Barches and Leanne Philipson. The episode was edited by Rebecca Barches. Our logo was designed by Nathifa Maruf. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can, any way that you can. Keep up to date with all our episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, as it helps others find the show. 
We'll be back with another in-depth conversation soon. See you then.